Okay, we are recording. Joey, how are you today? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. Absolute pleasure. Where are you today? London, Shoreditch. How are you finding the Shoreditch experience? Oh, it's good. There's a lot of, you know, every time we stay in a hotel in Shoreditch, everybody's down there on their MacBooks working all day. In the lobby. <laughs> I don't know if staying in the hotel or if this is just their, their office, but uh, it's packed down there. Yeah. I don't know what everybody's working so hard on. Oh, it's this hipster central Shoreditch. It's, uh, it's, it's, you know, what? it's an interesting place. It's, it's changed a lot. I've, I've put events on um, for years, like club nights and such in, in, in Shoreditch. And you go back 10 years and it was really, really arty and really sort of quite bohemian. And, and over the last 10 years, kind of, it's become gentrified and uh and it's and it's lost a little bit of something and uh, i don't know if you've you've noticed that in the times that you've been back into into london uh i have a little bit because i have when i used to come here in like 2007 or so as a solo artist i stayed with a friend who lived in shoreditch and it felt it felt quite different but it, that's a familiar experience you know going around the world and and where you know going to the venues like where we play uh or the or record stores um they're usually in uh communities that are uh are arty and bohemian and becoming gentrified it's it's yeah. kind of a common tale but we were, in, we were in williamsburg last week and i remember uh i used to go visit friends there around 2005 six when when uh that's when i finished college and some of my, my friends who moved to new york were moving to williamsburg and it uh felt kind of like the start of something and now williamsburg is just it's kind of just one big lululemon store isn't it yeah absolutely right let's kick off your playlist i'm going to ask you please joey to tell me the song that you regard as having the greatest ever intro please oh well okay let me start off by saying you know these superlatives are very difficult they, they, they <laughs> good they make it uh, they stymie me um sometimes but uh, I chose uh, Sissy Strut by The Meters. Tell um, me. Well, I mean, you don't need to tell me why, because it's it's so instantly amazing. But uh, but tell me why you chose it. I was thinking, I don't know why it popped into my head, but actually just the sound of the intro popped into my head. And I was, I was as I was thinking about songs that start off a certain way, I was thinking of a song, I was, I... It was just a bit of a brainstorm and the and actually the snare drum i know the famous thing is ah uh, yeah but the that like the snare drum part of it is the thing that came into my head and i was like what song am i thinking of that starts off with just like a pot like a bang yeah like that? and that and that was it i was i was turned on to that song um uh, by a a guitar player and collaborator of mine named Yohei Shikano, who we uh, used to play with a lot around LA about 2005 when I was just starting. And um, <clears throat> it blew it blew my mind the first time I heard it. I was, you know, now, I mean, I know it's one of the all time greats, but I didn't know it until a little bit later in life. Yeah. In, in regards to um, intros, I'm just interested as, as to, to speak to you with, with your songwriting hat on. Um, in the time of the, 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 that you've been making music, the way that people get their music and listen to their music has, has changed dramatically. You know, we're seeing the sort of, you know, streaming platforms dominating the, the way that people listen to music now. And there seems to be more, it seems even more competitive than it ever was in regards to getting your music heard. And, and we're seeing more commercial pop acts leaning towards these bite-sized songs may be tailored towards the sort of TikTok generation, which are these mm. sort of scientifically put together perfect pop gems that, you know, that, that, that are obviously very difficult to do. And there is an art to that, but I just want to know, I've asked this question 487 times now, Joey, and I've still never managed to frame it right. But I want to know <laughs> when you, when you're writing music now, does any of the kind of changes in how people get their music, ever filter through into your creative process do you get where i'm going with that i think so uh i, I i'm trying to i'm trying to find a way not to say no <laughs> you you won't be the first man that's fine <laughs> 
but uh no not really i mean i feel like since since i started writing songs it's just kind of been something i do sitting on the corner of my bed trying to make sense of something or process something and um I, I really don't want to sound too holy or precious about it. Like I would, like I'm immune to, you know, whatever these outside forces are, but for whatever reason, like that, that just doesn't seem to be a part of our, of our world. Sure. You know? um, I've tried to do like the songwriting thing where like Nashville songwriting or pop songwriting, where you meet up with people for a day or a half a day and try and write something that's going to be a hit for somebody. Um, I'm not very good at it. Don't particularly enjoy it. I actually kind of just hate it. I wish I liked it and was good at it. Um, I think it can be, you know, the craftsmanship in it can probably be fun and rewarding. And um, uh, but I just I, I can't do it for whatever reason. So the type of music that we make and the the way that I write songs and Kenneth writes songs and the way that we collaborate is just kind of feels to me to be a little bit outside that world and thankfully there's enough of an audience for for this kind of music that it's kept us going was there ever a sort of discussions with like um you know labels and such regarding like oh we need to put an edit together for for radio and things like that how were you with kind of conversations like that or if, if they did arise uh never an edit the only we've always you know we had a um we put our first two albums out on our own back before there was streaming and so we just put them on our website for free as like a download of a massive zip file that people could get and that that felt very good to do at the at, at that time and, and you know remember that was 2011 there was no there was no music industry basically yeah. at that time and um then we had a, a, a record deal for three albums with Anti Records, who's a wonderful independent label who would, they, none of the people there would ever dream of, you know, any anything but full creative control for the artist. Wonderful. So we've never really known anything different other than that. And now we're in a joint venture with our own label and 30 Tigers, who are the same way. Uh, so the only The only thing I will say has ever been a little bit of a point of contention is, you know, we write a lot of slow, sad songs. And uh, nobody ever thinks that those are going to be your popular ones. So anytime we ever try to get a song on the radio, not like big commercial radio, but like uh, non non commercial radio or like yeah. NPR in the U.S. stuff like that, uh, or certain BBC stations that have played us, uh, all the the people on our teams and our labels, they usually want to push like the one or two more up tempo songs that we have. And we've always disagreed with them on that. And we've always said, like, just put, give them the five minute dirge. It's the what, it's what we love to do. It's what our, anyone who's a fan of our band, that's why they're a fan. You know, our biggest song still to this day is a song called Michigan, which is a five minute breakup ballad, essentially. And it was never pushed to, you know, it was never a focus track. It was never a single. It's just the one that our fans over the years have liked and get it. It's still the only song that anybody in the world knows without knowing really who the, who we are. Yeah. It's a song that kind of outgrew us, and it it was it's it's just I don't really know why, but um, so that's the only thing we ever disagreed with our team on on like commercial strategy was like when we go on uh, the Jimmy Kimmel show, like let us play a ballad, let us play our our slow song, but nobody ever wanted that, so. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to take you uh, back for track two, and I'm going to ask you, please, Jack, tell me the first song you remember hearing that had an emotional impact on you, please. Oh yeah, well, so it's it's uh, Brahms, lullaby, Brahms lullaby. My parents used to sing it to me and my brother as we were falling asleep. So, I mean, as I don't remember ever not knowing that song, and now I sing it to my kids when they go to sleep. Um, so to me, that feels like the oldest song in the world. Oh, wonderful. Was, I mean, where was home and was, was home a musical place growing up? Home was Los Angeles and it was a very musical place. Um, both of my parents worked. My mom was a special ed teacher. Dad was a psychologist, um, but they are both musical. My dad taught me to play the guitar 
on a nylon string guitar that was my mother's from the 70s. She actually was in a, a folk harmony duo herself with her best friend in college. They didn't, I don't think, wrote, write so, their own songs or anything. They just went in, you know, in the coffee shops in the 70s and played Joan Baez songs. Yeah. Like, like so many other college students, probably. Um, but their music collection, uh, which mostly stopped it you know, is a crystallization of, you know, about the time that our uh, kids started being born. Uh, so it's mostly folk and rock and roll from the 60s and 70s. But that's basically what formed my musical tastes and um, and what I am nostalgic for and what I feel good listening to. So that's, you know, the Beatles and Led Zeppelin and Neil Young and Bob Dylan and Crosby, Stills and Nash and Joan Baez and Joni Mitchell. Um, so yeah you drawn to the stereo was that something that you would sort of gravitate towards and you know would you sit there and and sort of marvel at the, the you know the, the the record sleeves and such yeah it was all cds i don't know they, at some point they replaced their record collection with the cd collection so our shelves were full of cds in the 80s and 90s um but yeah there was always music on in the house and uh one of the first things that i did when I, uh, I think I was like 11 or 12, I saved up to buy my own like uh, stereo, like boom box, you know, um, for my room so that I could play my own music in my room. Um, and for, for many years, I, uh, I fell asleep to Led Zeppelin IV, which is not the best <laughs> like nighttime <laughs> music, but um, I don't know why that's what I, I, you know, I played Black Dog and went to sleep. <laughs> before we uh we move on to your next track i just want to ask you if you uh in regards to that brahms track if you close your eyes and could you know hear it in your head what if you had to pinpoint the emotion what was that what would that emotion be oh it just feels um peaceful home you know home and in that in those days was a happy and carefree place i was very lucky in that way and so um it, yeah it feels just sort of peaceful and full of uh love beautiful beautiful <laughs> tell me the song that reminds you of your time at school please joey oh okay so school days i took to mean um uh, I took to mean sort of middle school and high school. Sure. And uh, there were a few different phases, but one of the biggest phases for us, for me and my friends, was when uh, Sublime's self-titled album came out in, that would have been 1995, maybe. Um, uh oh, have I lost connection? Oh, there you are. Um, yeah, Sublime's self-titled album. When that came out, that was a huge phase for us and so i and for uh, about like six seven years in there um i was uh we were i was a big surfer and we grew up in los angeles and we would every chance we got we would drive out to anywhere along the southern california coast from ventura county down to san diego county and surf and so and we listened to sublime almost exclusively for it had to be about a year and a half um, so I chose the opening track from that album, Garden Grove, um, which is would have been a, a good uh, candidate for for in, best intro. Absolutely. Of all time, because you you know you hear that the high synth sound and then the 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 um, the sort of dubby kind of uh, drum kit comes in and then the bass. Uh, yeah, that really takes me back to a time and a place, and it feels like driving out to the ocean to go surfing all day with my friends. Lovely. Did you enjoy school, Joey? Uh, you know, it's funny. I think I, I thought I did. And uh, looking back, it was very pressure filled. I, I was, but that, you know, you put that on yourself. I put that on myself. Um, but uh, it took me a couple of years to decompress, I think, <laughs> from that. Um, and actually finding, finding music and the love of writing music and uh, playing music which didn't happen for me until college um, was a big, uh, yeah, was a big release from, I think, the, the pressure that I put on myself 
you, you, you say that um, music didn't really sort of come along until college. What did you What did you think you was going to do when you was at school? What did you want to be? Oh well, I was going to be a uh, uh, I was going to be a neuroscientist. I liked studying the brain, and so all of my classes were in neuroscience, and I was starting to apply to go to graduate school just to keep going to school for neuroscience. And then after that, all you do is just keep researching neuroscience and just be in academia, I guess. And um, it was, I, I liked it, but it was a little bit of a default because I didn't really know what else I wanted to do. Yeah. And um, actually, so I started playing in a band and writing songs and playing in a band in college. Uh, although that was just for fun. And my friends in the band had a bit of an intervention with me, like literally sat me down. And, um, and at the end, as we were graduating and they said, you know, what? obviously our band is kind of just for fun and we're not really going to all going to do this, but we think your songs are good. And like, you would be a shame if you didn't, you know, have a go at it as a, as a songwriter, a singer songwriter. So um, that I, I never thought of it until then. Uh, yeah. I mean, how, how great is that? That people, not your friends pulled you aside and made a point of telling you that they they see something you know really good in, in in what you was doing. I mean, that's that's good friends right there, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was extremely foresighted because I'll tell you the songs that I was writing at the time gave nobody <laughs> any reason that they should have encouraged. You know, those they must have been the best A uh, and R guys of all time to say. You know, <laughs> Ten years from now, I think this could you could be something. These songs could be good in about a decade. Fantastic. Um, I'm going to ask you um, to tell me for track four, please. The first song you remember buying from a record store, please, mate. Oh yeah, well, it was the day that I bought my boombox for my room when I it was like twelve, and the the CD that I bought at the warehouse which was the local CD store, was um, was the album Regulate G-Funk Era by Warren G. Do you remember I mean, the song Regulators featuring Nate Dogg? What a tune. What a tune. And yeah. I, I mean, am I right in saying that was all music that was coming from where you was living, right? Yeah. Yes, that's right. Yeah, so we were in around that time, like, you know, Snoop Dogg and Dr. Dre were like the biggest things going. And I think Warren G was like Snoop's cousin or something like that. All of them, you know, from Long Beach and Compton in that area. And so that West Coast, Southern California hip hop thing was was huge amongst us suburban white kids. And um, I, I got cassette tapes of of a doggy style and the chronic as a 10th birthday presents from my grandmother. She didn't listen to that first, did she? I don't know. She must not have looked at the album covers either because I didn't, I honestly, as a 10 year old, I did not know what it all, what it meant. I didn't know what the weed leaf was on the front of the chronic. And I didn't understand the cartoonish depictions on the front of, of doggy style, nor did I know what doggy style meant. Uh, but she, I asked for those albums and she got them for me and just said, happy birthday. Here you go. Fantastic. <laughs> she's, a, she's, a, she's a progressive lady. She's an artist. She's a painter. And so I, I think she, she, she must have known more than she let on. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about uh, record stores. And you, you, you've just said to me that you're in Shoreditch at the moment, um, over a plane. Um, when you are on tour and you travel about and you go to, to new cities and towns and such. Uh, you know, I know every time I go into Shoreditch, there's there's various record stores that I like to frequent. Um, do you find yourself drawn to the record shop still? I do. But when we travel, I like to, you know, go to whatever the closest record store is. And I like to buy old records uh, for my collection and for our turntable at home. I really enjoy um, I, I like it's where it, in whatever town you're in, you know, that like your, your people will be there, you know, it's just like a sort of a beacon in the community for a certain type of person. And, um, and so I like that feeling and there's usually a good uh, cup of coffee to be had nearby as well. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Shout out, Rough Trade. <clears throat> okay. I'm going to, uh, we're, we're going to go clubbing. And for track five, I'm going to ask you to tell me the song that soundtrack your years clubbing. Oh, yeah. Well, if I had clubbing years, I don't know that I really did. But it's um... so strange, Joey. So many musicians that have made music and, and for, you know, throughout most of their lives. Mm -hmm. On this question, so many of them just go, I didn't really go clubbing. And I think by then, most bands were at touring, you know, living in the backs right. of their cars and, and gigging hard and stuff like that. And so, so many people didn't ever really do that that clubbing thing, which uh, which was a, a, there's been a big surprise for me. When I sort of set this up, I thought, oh, after parties, it'd be loads. But no, it doesn't appear to be. So, so tell me your relationship with it. Yeah. Well, you know, we're 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 like we're folk musicians you know <laughs> so the uh but in the, you know when i was young and want, and g wanting to go to parties and clubs and and all that um when i read that question immediately the song that popped into my mind was hey ya by outcast because for a minute you couldn't go out anywhere and not hear that song that was ubiquitous and to me like when i think of being at a club or a party i just assume that that song will come on even yeah. though i know it's been 20 years now like i still think that song is going to come on if there's enough people and it's loud enough in a certain area um, my brain is like oh when is when is hey y'all gonna come on it yeah. doesn't usually anymore <laughs> what a great record though great record that blew everybody's mind when it came out yeah i mean we, we spoke about the meters at the beginning i mean you can hear the influence on on, on that cast from bands from that generation certainly you know bands like the meters definitely had a huge impact on on uh, loads of the stuff I think that Atkast were doing back then. That is very true. That is very true. And the song structure of Hey Ya, like, is so confounding. Um, it feels like it feels like a pop song in a lot of ways, but it's very weird. It's very strange. Which actually, I think a lot of it's like a misconception about pop songs is that they're formulaic and the same as each other which is true for a lot of them, but the great ones are weird and different in, in a lot, in uh, certain intriguing ways. And I think it like tricks the mind and uh, delights the mind in that way in being fooled. And so that Hey Ya is definitely one of the great ones in that respect. The way that you just sort of, you know, psychoanalyze the, the, the makeup of that, that track there, when, when you listen to music, you know, as somebody that, that makes music, do you find it hard to just, step back and listen to a, a, a finished piece of music or do you instantly feel drawn to kind of break it down and go oh what have they done there how have they done that or yeah. can you can you comfortably sit back and just let it wash over you uh almost never anymore can i just sit back and comfortably let it wash over me which is one of the great sacrifices i think you make to become a a make a mu music maker it's probably true in other fields as well i, I like the um I, I get my fix on that front now from comedy because uh I, I love comedy and i love it in a sort of naively enthusiastic way i love good comedy and i love bad comedy and i don't really analyze it i just i'm just delighted by it all the time and i used to before i made music I'd be that way about music and uh i i worried when i decided to become a musician that that i would lose that sense of naive enthusiasm and i did and i have and it's been worth the sacrifice i have to say but um but yeah no, no everything is uh um it, it's impossible for me to hear music pretty much without um you know thinking about it yeah yeah <laughs> there are exceptions to that which is so so delightful and i and i usually and move to tears by those experiences. Um, so it is possible. I'm gonna take you home for track six. I'm gonna ask you please to tell me a favorite song from your home county, please. Oh, county. I thought it said country and I was like, from my favorite song from America? Okay, that's a wide net. 
I'm sorry I misunderstood. You'll, you, you'll probably be about the 400th person to have misunderstood. I don't know why I don't put county in giant capital letters because it happens every episode and I still haven't amended the question. Um, it is county, okay. but not country. But I'm happy if you want to go with country. Unless, <laughs> well, unless you can pluck something from a home county. Uh, man, oh, I should. Okay, I wish I would have thought a little. I wish I would have realized that. So but I'm from Los Angeles. Kenneth and I are both born and raised in Los Angeles. And um, we've actually just started. We've just announced and launched the first Los Angeles Folk Festival. And there's never been a Los Angeles Folk Festival. There have been folk festivals in Los Angeles, but never the Los Angeles Folk Festival it never happened, despite, in my opinion, Los Angeles being one of the great epicenters, sort of unsung epicenters of folk music. So I think about like Woody Guthrie and his, you know, as soon as he got to Los Angeles from uh, Oklahoma, he became a radio DJ and books have been written about how he was sort of radicalized and became political by his time in Los Angeles, living on Skid Row and having a radio station downtown and doing that radio show. And then through to like the 1960s in Laurel Canyon, where you, you kind of the folk rock epicenter of Crosby, Stills and Nash and Joni Mitchell uh, and Jackson Brown and the, the Doors you know, was happening. And then today, I think it's it's an episode, epicenter of, of folk music, mostly centered around like certain venues, like like Largo, where we play a lot, where folk musicians and comedians intermix a lot, like as though it were uh, the Greenwich Village of the 1960s in New York City. So there's so much there to draw from in Los Angeles specifically. And so let's see. Well, I've got Graham Nash on the mind a lot recently because we've just been talking, we've been uh, uh, talking to him and about him recently. And uh, so I, 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 I want a little more time to think about it, but uh, his song, Our House, which is specifically oh. about the house that he and Joni lived in, in Laurel Canyon, which... Kenneth now lives in Laurel Canyon and I, my wife and I lived in Laurel Canyon for five years. And I think we were about four doors down from that house when we lived there. Um, so, so what a great, you know, sort of classic ode to a specifically Los Angeles location. Perfect. Perfect. And you've done that. Well, you pulled that out of the bag there. The pressure was on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's your last track. And, and this is when you, uh, you, you get to be a, a, a tastemaker. And I'm going to ask you, please, to tell me a song that you think many may not know that you would like them to hear, please. Oh, yeah. This is a tough one, too, because there's so many. But our dear friend, Aeneas Mitchell, who I don't know if you know or if your listeners will know, um, but she is, uh, to, to my mind, one of the greatest songwriters of our generation and has made incredible albums um, like... Young Man in America, and also wrote, uh, she had a, a incredible commercial success with the uh, musical that she wrote, which after over a decade of working on it, became a huge hit on Broadway called Hades Town, uh, and won all the Tonys. And, and uh, I remember 15 years ago when she was putting it on in community theaters in Vermont, and she just kept working on it for her whole life. It's like her her magnum opus and, and, and had huge success with it on Broadway, magnificent show. But this past year, she put out a, a self-titled folk album just as Aeneas Mitchell and um, as 10 or 12 or whatever of uh, unimpeachably great uh, songs from from like I said one of the one of the best songwriters of our generation and my favorite I think is called Little Big Girl. I've been obsessed with songs about coming of age and the ideas the idea of <laughs> you know becoming an adult which uh, for pe for me and I think people of our generation is a little bit of a nebulous concept about when exactly that happens. Um and and she and I are the exact same age, and she captures the the ambivalence 
of becoming an adult and in this song specifically becoming a woman um so miraculously in three minutes um it's worth it's it's worth everybody's time to hear this song little big girl by Anais mitchell which are we make it easy for listeners to uh, go and explore that track uh, and every other track that we've spoken about today because we put together a little spotify playlist to accompany the podcast so people can go and listen to everything that we've spoken about today oh wow it's going to go from sublime to warren g to <laughs> anais mitchell fantastic absolutely absolutely um and so before we start to, to wrap things up Joey, what's, what's, what's happening? What can people expect from you uh, for the rest of 2023? Oh, well, you know, you've, you've caught us on the release day of our brand new album. Uh, we have a new album called I Only See the Moon, which took us a long time to make. We usually make records very quickly, and we decided that, uh, you know, we needed to really hold ourselves to, uh, to something that we could believe in that would really, you know, capture the sort of the initial spark of collaboration that that brought us together 12 years ago and, and see where that would lead us after all this time. You know, the world has changed and we've changed as people uh, in that time, of course. And so we're extremely proud about it. And um, it's out it's out today after a couple of years of working on it. Fantastic. And if people want to find out about the record, want to find out about live shows, where's the best place to keep up to speed with yeah. everything that's happening? Milkcartonkids.com, and we'll have tours, you know, all over the world. We're going to Australia in July, the North America mostly through the fall. I'm in London now, but uh, we'll be back in the UK um, in January. Fantastic. Look forward to that. Joey, it's been an absolute delight talking records with you. Thank you so much, mate. Likewise. Thank you, Stu. Pleasure. I'm going to press stop, don't go anywhere. <laughs>